As an anarchist, or more precisely as an anarcho-communist, I'm usually asked a few questions, one of which usually being how I think anarchism or communism would even work or be achieved. The fact of the matter is, I can't speak for all anarchists, and it's something that needs to be heavily discussed between anarchists in order to arrive to thorough answers, but I'll happily try to give my opinions on the matter. I think looking at real-life examples of anarchistic movements working would be quite helpful to explain my positions, and currently, one of the most successful and most recent attempts of libertarian policies anywhere worldwide probably has to be Russia, which is a rather quite large portion of northern Syria. And although they're not entirely anarchist, they still have a semblance of a state, and they still have a carceral system. The idea at the base of their movement, called uh, democratic confederalism, was mainly theorized from an ambassadorial exchange between Abdullah Öcalan and Murray Bookstreet, the former being the one to come that term, democratic confederalism, and the latter being a well-known anarchist and ecologist, philosopher, I guess you could say. Um, in fact, democratic confederalism borrows a lot from another idea by Mark Bookchin, which is called libertarian municipalism. In short, libertarian municipalism is a prominent form of communalism, the latter being, according to Wikipedia, a system that integrates communal ownership in confederations of highly localized independent communities. Libertarian municipalism, sometimes even called uh, libertarian communalism, <laughs> takes that and as the value of libertarian movements to spice it up. And also, in case you're wondering, I say libertarian, but it's basically a fancy name to say anarchism. Usually it's translated as libertarian, but, well, you see the problem with that, I guess. To come back to Rojava a little bit, uh, they've been following democratic confederalism for more than a decade already, and despite the occasional bombings maneuvered by the Turkish government and betrayals from the US Army, they're still doing pretty fine as a libertarian movement in the midst of a fucking civil war while being placed right next to their biggest threats. However, Democratic Confederalism adapts libertarian municipalism on pretty large-scale regions, and honestly, that's probably quite fit during a civil war. But I'm not so sure about a somewhat peaceful country there. So, what is my take here? Well, I think libertarian municipalism is pretty damn promising, that's what I'm trying to say. But instead of doing it on large-scale regions or federations, I think we need to do quite the opposite. Instead, I think we need to build relatively small autonomous zones, whether they be squats in apartments uh, and houses which have been abandoned, or zads in biodiverse places endangered by pollutant planning. Whatever does the job, really. But also, we need to develop a bit of strategy if we don't want to get crushed by the police and military right away. So obviously, the further away uh, the closest police station is, and the fewer policemen are there are, the better. On the other end, um, the more vacant and urban buildings, the more homelessness and precarity, and the more likely it is that we could build a lasting autonomous zone with a great and diverse community. Uh, right now, the closest things we have to this kind of stuff are, well, squats, uh, but also zads, etc. The thing is, they're all different forms of what we call temporary uh, autonomous zones, or TASIs for short. Um, the idea here is to get those TASIs to become permanent autonomous zones, or PASIs. Obviously, that's not all that needs to happen. Uh, if we want communism or anarchism to last in these autonomous zones, we need to ally ourselves between passes and to propose, debate, and agree on policies in order to structurally and incentively hinder the search of unsolicited 
and unneeded hierarchical structures, one of which being, for example, oppression. On my end, uh, I think that these policies need to abide on empirical, statistical, and peer-reviewed scientific evidence in order to determine how severely and unfairly some traits are being treated so that we can determine uh, adequate and fair protections for people who happen to have these traits. Basically, everyone will be protected in some way or another in order to remove as many barriers as possible for them to fully unleash their individual potential and truly giving everyone the same chances to do so. It will be quite naive not to incorporate this kind of thing, maybe even dangerous. It does mean, though, that we need as many people to be able to read scientific results with as much of a critical eye as is required to find methodological bugs and to know when to trust, ignore, or discard a scientific study. Sorry for the backing in the background. Although it may be difficult, we as activists should do everything we can to ensure that people get well educated on this matter uh, and aren't being left out in misunderstanding. In the end, this is obviously up to the person's choice to follow this kind of courses or not. But I think it's very important to develop you know, more critical thinking and being able to debunk and argue with factual statements in order to construct more cohesive political policies. Um, you don't have to understand everything about epistemology, synthetics, or whatever, but everyone is at least able to understand the most fundamental parts of this. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, I'll I'll talk about this part more in a future video, because it's not really the subject here, but just keep that in mind. And then there's the economy, and honestly I just think an anarchist or communist economy only has to disincentivize the privatization of the means of production, and in counterpart, make the means of production as accessible as possible, hence decentralizing the production of material resources in order to produce less and make people more aware of how are built the things they are demanding, ensuring a bit of trust and security overall, as well. And as the old saying goes, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. The economy could take many forms, and each autonomous zone, or as I usually call them, each commune, could have a drastically different economy than some of its allies as long as it suits as many people within the commune. Once again, the economy of any commune should take into account what its inhabitants are able to do and are willing to offer, as well as the resources they demand for. And of course, intercommunal trades are necessary to meet those demands, which is why I mainly think that we need as communes to ally ourselves, maybe even more so, than to defend ourselves. Talking about defense though, it's important that we try to strategically avoid as much armed conflict as possible, but I don't think it could ever be a zero percent chance that we get attacked, nor anything even remotely close to that percentage. Therefore, it's important that we organize armed forces to counter attacks from police forces, the army and other terrorist groups, uh, but their importance should be strictly proportional to how much we require any defense whatsoever, which hopefully should be limited to its bare minimum. These armed forces will be open to basically anyone as long as they are willing to be trained in armed combat tactics by people who have a bit of experience in that kind of stuff and wish to share their skills to their willing comrades. These armed forces should also primarily serve to protect the inhabitants of the multiple commons they could work for. And obviously, if someone wants to leave at any point, they should be able to. Uh, otherwise, you're violating their will, and that's pretty shit. I think that's already a lot to digest, so I think I'll end there for now. Uh, there's still way more to talk about, but I think there are some stuff that needs 
a bit more in phases. Uh, like compressing it all in a single video would probably be a bit hard to take in. Um, I have two more video ideas and I still don't know which one I'll do first. Uh, either I'll talk about uh, constructivism, rehabilitative justice and transhumanism, uh, why I love all three of them and how I think they're all kind of intertwined with each other in my opinion. Or I'll talk about direct democracy, uh, political participation and voting systems. Uh, either way, uh, I'll be more than happy to nerd out and talk about this kind of stuff with y'all. Uh, and also, I have no fucking idea how to end this video, so bye!